Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college, and I'm really grateful to see a, a good audience out here today. When you're trying to schedule programming, as I often do, sometimes six or more months in advance, you never really know how timely an event will be. Will it touch upon an issue that seems pertinent or that gets lost in the news of the busyness of the moment by the time it happens? I have to admit that I'd really rather that today's lecture, that this be the case with today's talk, that uh, it had drifted off into irrelevance. Uh, today's talk, a, Latinx a Latinx political ethics for the hopelessness of our community. I wish it had somehow magically become irrelevant in the months since we first discussed this talk. But instead, as many of us know very well, uh, some sense of hopelessness has been magnified. Uh, real hope, not just groundless or foolish optimism, uh, is in short supply for many people at the moment. I won't suggest that today's speaker is charged with leaving us with hope, but I do know that he's an outstanding person to help us think through about how to move forward right now in light of our shared political and cultural moment. So I'm grateful to uh, the Reverend Dr. Miguel de la Torre, who's here to speak to us today. Miguel de la Torre is an act, a religious scholar, an author, activist, and an ordained minister. He's professor of social ethics and Latino and Latina studies at Ilif School of Theology in Denver, and has taught at the Cuernavaca Center for Intercultural Dialogue and Development in Mexico, the Indonesian Consortium in Religious Studies, the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, and Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. He's co-founder of the Society of Race, Ethnicity, and Religion, and has served as a president of the Society of Christian Ethics, the preeminent organization for Christian ethicists. A prolific author, several of his books have won national awards, including Reading the Bible from the Margins in 2002, Santeria, The Beliefs and Rituals of a Growing Religion in America in 2004, Doing Christian Ethics from the Margins in 2004, and just this year he published The U.S. Immigration Crisis, Towards an Ethics in Pl of Place, and Liberating Sexuality, Justice Between the Sheets. Born in Cuba a few months before the Castro Revolution, he migrated to the United States with his family as refugees when he was an infant. For a time, he was considered an illegal immigrant and was asked to self-deport. As a scholar activist, he's been an expert commentator concerning ethical issues such as humanic, human, Hispanic religiosity, LGBT rights, uh, immigration rights, and several local national on several local, national, and immigration, international media outlets. Tomorrow night at 7 in Stein 120, you have a chance or an, op an opportunity to screen Dr. De La Torre's uh, documentary, Trails of Terror, which explores the historical and economic reasons for the current immigration and humanitarian crisis on the United States border. Before I turn the podium over to him, I do want to note that talk, this talk is one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. We're grateful to John Deitchman of the class of 1970 and his family for the support that makes it possible. I also want to thank, as always, Professor Benny Liu for uh, his leadership in bringing this event to Holy Cross, and to thank our co-sponsors uh, for today's talk, Latin American and Latino Studies, Peace and Conflict Studies, SGA Diversity, uh, who included this in Unity Week. So please join me in welcoming Miguel de la Torre. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. So I took a group of students to Cuernavaca, Mexico, and the idea was to examine and connect how our global economic policies is linked to the poverty in Cuernavaca. So we took students to the squatter villages, which is called La Estación, the station, which is right outside of Cuernavaca, which used to be a train station. And we spent the day looking and talking to individuals who were living in, in, in basically huts. Um, that evening, we began to unpack what we saw. And one of my students said, you know, when I looked into the eyes of that little girl, I saw the hope in her eyes. To which I had an epistemological meltdown and, and basically told her, I'm not sure what you saw in her eyes, but in a few years, she's going to be turning tricks to put food on the table. There is no hope for her. What I found my student was doing is by embracing hope, 
she distanced herself from how her social location was directly related and tied to the poverty of this little girl. You see, as long as there's hope, as long as Jesus is going to take care of it, then I don't have to do anything. I just rely on Jesus and don't have to really question how I am directly complicit with this little girl's poverty. So, so I'm going to do tonight, in, in, in trying to flesh out this political ethics rooted in the Latinx experience, is really go after one of the sacred cows of our faith. You know, to be a Christian, uh, uh, the gifts of the spirits are what? Love, joy, peace, and hope. So I am calling for hopelessness, knowing that I'm going against a tradition here. Um, Romans 8, 28, all things work for good for those who are called to God's purposes. I love that verse. But it really is meaningless to the vast majority of the world that is dying in poverty. And, and, and to say that as my response in the face of, of, of this horrific poverty becomes somewhat callous and somewhat cold. And, and it just really just excuses me from having to deal with my complicity with these global structures. Now, now in Spanish, for those of you who are able to speak the language of the angels, the word hope is, is translated as esperanza. Now, esperanza comes from the word esperal, which means to wait. You see, in Spanish, to have esperanza, to have hope, is to wait. And not necessarily wait for something good. You could also be waiting for nothing. So there's a dark side to hope when we talk in Spanish. And what I'm trying to do is, is grasp that ambiguity that the word esperanza has. I'm sure you all heard the sermon about the little girl in the beach where all the starfish have washed up. Nod if you head if you know what I'm talking about. And the little girl is picking up the starfish and throwing it back into the ocean. You have a grumpy old guy there saying, you can't save them all. And she picks up one and says, I'll make a difference in this one's life and throws it back. Okay. I'm the grumpy old man <laughs> sitting by the seashore. Because while we may lift up the one and put them on a pedestal, that one made it, my eye is on the thousands and thousands of dead bodies on the beach asking why do we have this genocide and this massacre. Yeah, we could save one. Yay, hallelujah, that's great. And true, it'll make a difference in one person's life. But my focus is on the vast majority who end up dying. Fun fact, maybe not fun. Every four days, five brown bodies die crossing the desert to enter this country. Okay, let me say that again, because you don't read this in the news. Every four days, five brown bodies perish. Based on a national policy, designed by liberal politicians, I hate to see what happens when the conservatives take over, it, which is called a, a policy of deterrence to make things so difficult for migrants that they will not bother coming. And what happens is death. Not since the days of Jim and Jane Crow do we have policies in place depending on people dying so that other peoples of that same color and race do not do the same things. Okay. So my focus is on the four, five bodies that die every four days littering the sands. So yes, we may save one, 
but I am hopeless because it's all those other bodies that are the focus of my thinking. So, hope only works if I buy into a Hegelian dialectical history. And, and what that basically means is this idea that history has a purpose and a meaning, that somehow we are all progressing in an upward trajectory that's going to lead to some utopian future. Okay. Marxism, capitalism are, are products of a salvation history, that the future will be better than the past. But what if history has no purpose? What if history doesn't care if we succeed or fail? What if history just is? Unfortunately, I, I drank the Foucault Kool-Aid, and, 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 and he, he helps me understand that history could move forward or backwards or not at all. It is disjointed, nonlinear, and disconnected that the advances we made, say, in eight years, can be reversed overnight. Hint, hint. So, the embracement of hopelessness is really based on a rejection of a salvation history, not just religious but political as well, that assumes that the future is going to be better than the past. Because what I'm arguing is, for certain people, globally, the future has always been worse for the past, thanks to globalization and neoliberalism. There is no teleology. There is no permanent history. You, you all read about, every once in a while, they discover Jesus on a tortilla, you know, and we, we see that, you know. Our brains, this is, this is neo, neo scientists have mapped out the brain to figure out what's going on. And it says that our brains are geared to see a face in static information. You know, they, they did this test where they showed static information and people saw a face in it. When they said there's a face there, they see the face. In the same way, I would argue that in the staticness of time, our minds are geared to put order into it. And that order is this dialectical progressive history that we're moving forward. I love MLK. I love Martin Luther King. But I think he got it wrong when he said that the arc of history may be long, but it bends towards justice. All too often, it bends towards injustice. Or it doesn't bend at all because it doesn't care. We could be as unjust and as racist and as xenophobic and as homophobic tomorrow as we were yesterday. There is no plan that somehow the future is going to be enlightened. That's the embracement of the hopelessness that I'm calling for. Ecclesiastes probably said it's best, vanity of vanities, awe is vanity, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless, Ecclesiastic 1.1. I begin there in the realization of this ancient writer who is basically saying there is no rhyme or reason to the passage of time. If this is true, are, are we all happy now? Are we uplifted? Okay. <laughs> if this is true, radical solidarity becomes the embracingness, embracing the hopelessness of the moment. All too often, for those who are Christian, we're in such a rush to get to Easter Sunday that we never pause in Saturday where all we know is death and crucifixion, 
not knowing if there's going to be a resurrection, all we know is that hope is gone. And even for those who become ministers, they end up planning these, you know, Easter Sunday services years in advance and never pay attention to the Saturday where it's totally hopeless. And I would argue that the vast majority of my people live in that Saturday, especially now where we're looking at families being torn apart. We, we believed that we were going to be protected, our, our kids would be protected because of DACA, that they could, go, DACA, they could go to school and not be deported. That's no longer the case. We've been lied to. Not uncommon. <laughs> our families are going to be torn up. We live in Saturday. And radical solidarity means are you willing not to come and tell me about Easter Sunday and resurrection and just sit in the dust with me on Saturday. Because to tell me all things work for good for those who are going to God's purposes when I'm crying in Saturday is insulting. What I need is solidarity and for you to just be there with me in my hopelessness. This raises the question, then, where is God in the midst of this hopelessness? That great modern-day theologian, Willie Allen, in his 1992 film, Husbands and Wives, has Gabe Roth asking the same question. And the character Gabe Roth is watching television where the announcer is quoting Einstein's famous um, saying, God doesn't play dice with the universe. So Gabe turns off the TV and walks away and says, no, God doesn't play dice. He plays hide and seek. God all too often has played hide and seek with the oppressed of the world. God at many times is simply absent. Even Jesus had to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I have to wrestle with even a certain sadistic trend in God, if I'm honest. I mean, look at the story of Job. For those of you who don't know your Bibles well, Job is that character who had it all. Wealth and kids and God, and, 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 and Satan comes along and says, I'll tell you what, if you take away everything, Job will probably curse you. And, you know, God being a betting man or woman or whatever says, I'll take that bet. And all of Job's kids died, or his wealth was gone, and, and his body was racked with illness. And, and Job cries out to heaven, why? And what's the response after 59 chapters of going back and forth? The final response is, none of your business. I'm God. How dare you even question me? I do whatever I want. I find that response lacking. I don't know about you. And then it says, well, then God went ahead and gave Job back his money and his wealth and his children. He had new children. But for anyone who ever lost a child, no number of expert children will make up for those losses. So I have to really wrestle with who this God is. Now, in the Hebrew understanding of Yahweh, there is a dark side to God that we Christians have lost. And we lost it because we had to go ahead and invent Satan to blame all the bad things on, you know. Um, and, and quite frankly, if, if, if we didn't have a Satan, we have to invent him to protect God from God. Because if we're honest, I mean, some of the scriptures are like, you know, God sends evil spirits onto Saul. I thought only good came from God, and God is sending evil spirits. In Isaiah, it says, if good or evil enters into a city, isn't that I, God, who sends it? So God sends good and evil. So uh, understanding of God has to be more complex than simplistic answers of God being a personification of all that's good. We really have to wrestle with who this God is. And in that wrestling, 
we find ourselves wrestling with the human dilemma and we find ourselves wrestling with this hopelessness that I am calling for. Now, hopelessness rejects the easy fixes. And, and I know my critics are saying, oh, but hopelessness, that's despair and that's horrible. It's not despair, it's desperation. And there is a difference in what I'm talking about. The reason individuals cross a desert to enter this country is not because they are hoping for something good. They're crossing the desert as an act of desperation because they have nothing to lose. Because to stay means death. And out of desperation, they take action. And, and, and I want to hold on to that desperation because what hopelessness does is that it reminds me that we are really in a point of desperation. And, 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 and this, what desperation does is that as long as I have hope, if I could keep my head down, not make eye contact, Maybe I could survive this. The sign over Dachau, work will set you free. It didn't. But if I believe and have hope that maybe I would survive Dachau, then maybe I won't rebel. I won't say anything. I'll keep my head down. What hope does is besides being a, priv a class privilege, that prevents those with privilege from getting involved to change structures because we could always hope God's going to take care of it. For the oppressed, hope becomes a self-imposed disciplinary act. I met a Chiapa rebel uh, one of the times I was in Mexico. And, and it was interesting. Um, he said that he went to the government's office to discuss the new taxation that was going to cause him to lose his land. And the bureaucrat looked up from the desk and says, ah, you smelly Indian, get out of here. So he told me, I went the next day and had a bandana over my face, and I was carrying an MK-47. And you know, they listened to me. And, and I have to really wrestle with the truth that no one is willing to give up their power as an act of generosity. That, the, that, that there is a certain element of danger, of risk, in any act of liberation. To be hopeless then means that if I have nothing to lose, then I'm willing to take whatever radical acts need to be taken to change my, 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 my present situation whether it be crossing the desert or standing before a bureaucrat who's taking away my land. To be hopeless becomes, I would argue, solidarity among the oppressed. Now, Walter Benjamin, who is a philosopher, um, interesting, he was, he was running away from the Gestapo, made it to the Spanish border, and... Um, when the Gestapo entered the land, they closed the border, and he ended up committing suicide only for the next day for the border to be opened up. He has really helped me understand this a little bit better because he talks about the Messiah not as someone who comes once and forever, but it's really some, it's someone that always appears in the shads of history who is really a subduer of all the Antichrist that exists. So, so, so Walter Benjamin has really helped me try to better understand how do I live with this hopelessness. So, neoliberalism has won. The global economic structures are designed to create global poverty. I was reading the Wall Street Journal on the other day, and it was talking about that for the next couple of years under the new uh, presidential administration, we're going to economically advance as a country. But long-term global poverty will become much more entrenched and much longer to deal with. 
So yes, the stock markets are going to go up because if you're cutting wages, if you're cutting taxes, of course they're going to go up because that's based on you know, a certain percentage making more profit. But in the long run, global economic structure runs. So, so neoliberalism has won, and not just in this election, because if I'm honest, if I'm really honest, the person I voted for was also in favor of neoliberalism and globalization and economic, in these economic structures. So what do you do when the global structures are designed to create global poverty? We're not, we're not going to overcome neoliberalism in our lifetime. I have no hope, no illusion, that somehow the people are going to get together and we're going to overthrow the, our masters and we're going to go ahead and, and, and bring in a new utopia. I have no illusion that's going to happen. It's not. So then how do I deal with this? Here's the problem with hope. For those of you who plan to be social workers, how long do social workers usually last in an industry? Five years, six years? And I would argue it's because they have hope that they could actually change the world. And then when they don't, they go into business or do something else. But if you begin by realizing it's hopeless, then you don't burn out because it doesn't depend on you. The reason I've been working with undocumented immigrants now for over a decade is because I have no illusion that 10 years from now, I'll still be working with undocumented immigrants in the desert trying to prevent them from being killed. I have no illusion that's going to be solved in the next 10 years, Not, regardless of who the president is. And therefore, because I have no hope, I could continue in the struggle because it doesn't depend on me to fight that struggle. Privilege means I can walk away. Privilege means I could get tired of this, and you know what? You know, I, I, I've done my duty. You know, I, 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 did the, I, I did all that, you know, rah-rah activist stuff for a while, and now I'm just going to go ahead and rest. You know, that's privilege. But when your very identity is threatening, and therefore invites violence, you don't have the privilege of walking away. So for me, whether I'm hopeful or don't have hope, really is irrelevant. My parents had to survive, period, and do whatever it takes to survive. I struggle not for some reward, but rather this hopelessness that I'm struggling with is what defines my very humanity. See, the battle is lost. I'm not going to win. But what I do is what makes me human. It's what gives my life meaning and purpose. Anyone can join the fight when we know we're going to win and jump on the bandwagon. I mean, and we saw that happen. I remember when I was working for LGBT civil rights um, before 2005 when no state had equal um, um, uh, marriage equality, the vast majority of people were against it. Now that pretty much a lot of states are, everyone is like was always for LGBT civil rights. But I remember when that wasn't the case. See, it's easy to jump on the bandwagon once you know you're going to win. But do you fight because you think you're going to win? Do you fight for justice because you think that somehow you're going to... No, you fight for justice because you have no other choice but to fight for justice. I have no other choice. It doesn't matter if I win or lose. It's what defines me as a human. So no, I... I don't fight because I think I'm going to, and I don't fight because I think I'm going to get a reward. I'm going to get an extra crown when I get to heaven, you know. Because then it's not fighting for justice. It's self-interest. So, now that we're totally hopeless, somebody say amen. 
now that we you know that 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 <laughs> that, that it, it's all horrible in the future what do we do i mean i'm an, i am an ethicist i can't just leave it there can i so what i have been advocating is what i call an ethics para joder now for those who know spanish i want to apologize right now because what I just said is a certain word that you never use in polite conversation. It's equivalent to an English word, which is four letters that begins with the letter F. And what I'm arguing is, when the structures are totally designed against you, all you can do is screw with the system. Now, I'm not saying screw with the system. Screw with the system. This is Jesus, the great Hoderon of all times, who overturns the tables in the temple and messes everything up. Okay. My model is the Jesus who makes a whip and overturns table, who literally screws with the system. Now, there is a price to pay. That's why he ends up getting crucified because he messes with people's pocketbook. Now, this idea of Joriendo is not anything that I came up with. I'm not that smart. It's what I see my people always doing. And, and I'll give you an example. I'll, do that. I'll give you a quick example. Um, in New York City, there was a gang, uh, a turf gang known as the Young Lords. And the Young Lords you know, what, 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 what a tough gang. But then some of the leaders got arrested and they became revolutionized and, and their consciousness was raised. And they began to do things, um, which I'm now looking back into history and calling, they, they were horiendo, they, they were screwing with the system. So, so I'll give you a couple examples. Um, they went ahead and, and, and went to, you know, to El Barrio and, and, they, and, they, and they swept all the garbage on the streets and they put them in bags and they put them on the corner and they scored a Called the sanitation department and says, you know, we clean up the streets. Can you please send a truck and pick up the garbage? And they laughed at him because the sanitation picks up garbage in the barrio whenever they felt like picking it up. This was back in the 60s. So they took those same bags to 3rd Avenue. They built a you know, three, four-foot wall, and they set it on fire during tra rush hour traffic. Cops came, beat them up, threw them in jail. But by screwing with the system, an interesting thing happened. The New York Times began to do an article about the sanitation department and about how they don't pick up the garbage in, in, in black and brown neighborhoods. And, and you know now, the garbage is picked up on every Tuesday and Friday in these neighborhoods. That's what I mean. I, I, I'm not inventing something. I'm looking at my community and seeing how they deal with oppressive structures that are beyond their ability to overcome. Also in New York, there was La Primera Iglesia Metrorita. And the young lords went to them and said, you know, we would like to use the church to have a food closet and a clothes closet and, and to have some attorneys here to help people with immigration and, and also to have some classes on, on, on brown pride. And the pastor says, ah, you commies, get out of here. So they came on Sunday doing service, and they picked up the pastor and they threw him out the door. And they nail shut the door and they put up a sign saying the people's church. And, you know, the church was full of people from that point forward for at least a month. And then the cops came and busted their heads and threw them in jail. And the church ceased being the people's church. So this ethics para joder is using the trickster as a way of holding those with power responsible for the rhetoric that they claim to believe in. It becomes a subversive. And in our cultures, we, we have this trickster. You know, if, if you're Cuban, you, you, it's Pepito. If you're Puerto Rican, it's Juan Bobo. If you're Mexican, it's Cantinfla. We've always had these trickster images within our cultures. In the African American culture, you have Bear Rabbit and Bear Bear and, and Bear Fox. And, and you also have, so, so, and, and, and the whole Bible is a book of tricksters which we lose the sight of through our Puritan, Puritan lens that we, that, that we read the big text through. But if this ethics by the Horeb recaptures this trickster and makes it foundational in how we do social activism. So how do you lie in order to reveal truth? 
How do you steal in order to bring justice to the people whose wages are being stolen by the 1%? How do you pervert, subvert, pervert the structures that are ungodly so as to bring liberation to the very least of these? And it's not something an individual could ever do. And in, in, the, in the book, I really argue that it has to be the community coming together and saying, these are the ethical acts we as a community are going to engage in. Part of this trickster image, I always say I am a Southern Baptist Catholic Santero because all parts of my spirituality, I can never separate them. And, and the Santeria part, we have El Egua which is the African god, which is the African trickster. And Eligua happens to be my saint. He happens to be the one on my head. So, so this idea of the trickster not only comes from my own Latino culture, but from, again, I'm a Caribbean boy, from my African roots as well. And it's embracing my cultural response to how to do ethical advocacy. So yes, I embrace the hopelessness of our people, knowing that there are no answers and we're not going to fix it. I embrace the hopelessness of the moment where I said every four days five brown bodies perish, and I believe that number is going to go up over the next four, maybe eight years. I embrace that hopelessness and do not curl up in the fetus position because I have no choices, but and then propel myself to praxis. But a praxis that subverts those very structures of oppression. And crucifixion may end up being the answer, not that anyone should seek it, but there's a risk involved here. But we have to take that risk because not to take the risk just confirms my middle class privilege that I don't have to take that risk. I'm going to pause there. I could see this was an uplifting conversation that everyone is like feeling great right now. And, and I'll be happy to have Q&A and, and, and answer any questions you may have or any concerns you may have or any pushback you may have. Please, please push back. Yes, what, what I have done, first of all, you, you, you can never really communicate that hopelessness. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the barrio, and it was just in the air. It literally hung in the air. Um, yeah, I made it out, but so many of my, co my, my friends and buddies never did. So what I try to do with, with, with students who are privileged, who, who, who don't understand what I'm talking about, is I take them down to the border with me. And we walk the trails, and we leave water and food, and then they talk to the people. And that revolutionizes them. You see, we, we have to move beyond the classroom and actually be in the trenches where the hopelessness hangs in the air. One of my, uh, the, the chair of my dissertation committee, John Raines, always said that the classroom is correctly named. It is a room of class a room where you learn your class, and a room that a certain class is allowed to be part of, and a certain class is not allowed to enter that room. So how do we move people out of this room of class to be in the presence of the classless? Not to come save them, not to provide them with words of encouragement, but to literally learn from them. And, and, and if I could do that, then I don't have to do anything. They get it. You know, every time I take students down to the border, they're the ones that turn my institution upside down. I don't have to teach a class or do anything. Yeah. Yes, and then we'll go over here. One of the reasons, and, and this is not so much with DACA, but just undocumented in general, um, I, I've been very active in the sanctuary movement, or what we call the new sanctuary movement, and where churches 
take in the undocumented and provide them with sanctuary. Very few churches have done that. Um, I've been involved with some that have. Um, and it's done publicly. So it says to the government, we are a sanctuary church. But again, this administration now is saying that they're going to withhold funding from cities and, and schools that claim to be sanctuary. So now the risk is going to go up. Um, we need to be thinking about how do we do then sanctuary churches, sanctuary schools, sanctuary houses. I mean, I'm talking about how do I make my house into a sanctuary house. And basically, in the, and not do it in hiding, but publicly. And live with the consequences that come with that, which could be horrible. I don't know. But definitely, those type of stands have to be made, you know, have to be taken. Writing an article about it and talking about it and hitting like on Facebook, it's not going to change any of that. We literally have to put our bodies on, that, on the line on some of these issues. Not just immigrant, but, 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 but you know, rolling back on, on LGBT civil rights, roll back on, 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 on women's rights. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening that we who do have privilege, because I do have privilege. I mean, they do pay professors nicely. You know, I'm not going to lie. I mean, how do I now use the privilege that I do have to overturn the very structures that have been privileging me? And that's something we all have to wrestle with. There was a question over here. Yes, and then we'll come here. Because for me, hopelessness is a realization that it's all lost. And then if it's all lost, we have permission to really be radical in our changes. The first time I ever gave this type of conversation was with No More Deaths, Border Links, and, uh, and the 1980s Sanctuary Movement. They had a joint conference in Tulsa dealing with the undocumented. And, 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 and this is when I, when I was first dealing with verbalizing, articulating this hopelessness. And, and John Fife, who is the one who began the Sanctuary Movement in the 80s, um, said that what hopelessness has done for him is that he is no longer burdened with trying to figure out what action to take that's going to go ahead and lead to success. And what Horiendo does for him is that it frees him from playing by the rules. So I really think that, and again, it's not something that I came up with. I really think that there's something here that could unleash uh, really a, 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 an aggressive activism that could bring about hopefully some change. You know, I always say we have to go now to the police department to get a permit from the police department to protest the police department for police brutality. We have developed structures that allow us to feel good about ourselves because we're protesting and, you know, the stuff, but doesn't change anything. We have to stop going to get the permit. If, if, I, if I show any type of hope, here's why I want you to reject it, okay? Because no matter what we do, people are going to continue to die in the desert. No matter what we do, there's still going to be racism and sexism uh, which is which is intertwined to the very fabric of this country for another couple of generations. Now, maybe in a hundred years, we may be in a more just place. I don't know. But I'm not counting on that. See, what hope does is that it short circuits, short circuits activism. Because as soon as we don't reach the goals of liberation, then we give up and, ah, it fails, so why bother? And what I want to say is, we're not going to reach it. But our humanity is not defined by our success. It's defined by the struggle for justice. That's what defines our humanity. And that's what I'm calling people to do. Now, if you want to have hope, fine. I mean, quite frankly, if somebody says I'm hopeful, I'm not going to talk him out of it. Sure, go ahead. But what I'm saying is, when they lose their hope, and they will, they're crushed. I have nothing to lose. You're absolutely right. I, I think that what, what we have done with hope is that we have given us an excuse not to do anything. We have defined that term, you know, thanks to people like Moltmann, in where, you know, 
at the end of history, we're going to look back and understand why everything happened and everything would have had meaning and purpose. I'm sorry, the Holocaust has no meaning and purpose, period. I'm not willing to go there. So, no, definitely. I think, I think what hope has become really what I keep calling the middle class privilege. So I'm trying to reconceptualize that. Now, if I could redefine it, that would have been great, but I think it has so much negative baggage that that's why I'm moving towards Esperanza, which gives me a little bit more leeway in playing with the definition of the, of the term. I don't know if there is an Easter. I, I, you know, and, 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 and I'm not talking, you know, theologically, yeah, okay, I, I got my fire insurance, I'm going to heaven, I already picked out my mansion, that's not a problem. But if there's no heaven, if there is no Easter, will I change what I'm doing now? Do I do the justice work for the sake of justice, or I do it because of some reward I'm going to get in a mansion with an extra ruby in my crown? Again, I'm all in favor of, of, of heaven. I, like I said, I've, I'm going there. I'm, I have no problem with that. But that's not important to me, because that's not why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, my, and, and what I'm arguing is, for the most oppressed of the world, they cannot see Easter. And to be in solidarity with them, I have to also not focus on Easter at this moment. I just have to focus on crucifixion, which is a horrible place to sit in. But that's where my people are. That's where the vast majority, not my people, the vast majority of the world is. And I think we lose a voice. We, we, we lose a witness. We lose a testimony when we're so focused on the answer that we don't spend time with the questions that arises on Saturday. So, so for me, theologically, yeah, Easter, fine, no problem. But for me, ethically, it's the Saturday that I have to dwell in. It's the Saturday where I have to root myself in if I'm going to be in solidarity and not paternalistically tell them about Easter coming. Yeah, I'm trying to think how I said don't count on anything. I mean, I, 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 I believe that. I mean, you know, hey, I, I, I counted on, uh, you know, on, on, on many things politically that was told to us, and which is not going to happen now. Um, but no, I want to say hopelessness is that realization that we may take two steps forward, but we're going to get pushed back five steps. Neoliberalism is so ahead of us that they already know how we're going to protest. And they've already designed ways to co-opt our very protests. You know, I, I always like to look at the civil rights movement. You know, King was fighting not just, wasn't necessarily fighting for, for equal rights and voting, he was also fighting for an equal distribution of wealth. But the system is co-opted and said, Hey, Civil Rights Act, that's it. We've arrived. Hallelujah. You know, civil rights worked. And it's like, well, no, voting was part of it. <laughs> there was more to it. So our, even our protest is co-opted so that we could have little victories and think we've arrived. So, so that's why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, no, I want to focus on this hopelessness, that, that, that the structures are designed to preserve itself and co-opt even as we try to move forward. Yeah. And of course, my rejection of any type of salvation history helps in that, because the future could be an, you know, another era of ignorance, or it could be a new enlightenment. We don't know. But I'm not betting on the latter. Um, I, I think as a community, we're very dis disorganized and disjointed. You know, because, you know, unlike the African American community that may have a, a similar memory, historical memory, that binds people together, we're from different nation groups. And therefore, we have different histories. And, and it's sometimes hard to find things that would bind us together as a people. So we're very disjointed. Um, I, would, I, would I would hope <laughs> 
that, um, you know, with this very anti-Latinx sentiment that we're feeling right now, that this may drive us at a necessity to have, to, you know, to, 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 to cross over these nationalistic boundaries that have been separating in the past. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm Cuban, who's very active in the um, immigration issue. And, and, and some of my other Latinx colleagues look at me and say, why are you doing this? You know, so there's suspicion. So maybe our new political milieu may move us away from some of these suspicions and may move us now to working with each other in more powerful ways. It's hard, I mean, it's hard to predict how we're going to move forward in this. I mean, you know, first of all, you cannot deport every undocumented person in this country. First of all, it would take like 27 years to do so. Um, so mathematically, it's not there. Now, can you deport a couple of million people? Yeah. But then Obama has deported about the same amount of people over his presidency. Not, you know, even the Latinx community have called him the deporter in chief which he did not appreciate. So, you know, it, it, we, it, it, if, if, the pres if the new administration does it low key, we may not even realize. If they start putting together a, um, a deportation force, you know, and more people end up being killed, then you may have more of an uprising. So, so it depends on how it's played out. Um, I, I, you know, in, in a way, and, and I know this sounds horrible, Sometimes really overt, oppressive actions may be what's needed to wake up a people and say, basta, enough. Because as long as it's done with a smile, we get you know, distracted with technology and Facebook and Westwood and all that stuff. Yeah, don't forget I'm a trickster also. So... And, and also, I'm, a, I'm impacted by Miguel de Unomuno, a great philosopher, who talks about the very contradictory and the paradox of even thinking through philosophically. So, so yes, I'm embracing those, that, that paradox that I am totally hopeless. And maybe by crucifying hope and embracing hopelessness, you might eventually get to resurrection. But I don't know that yet. But maybe we will. And, and that tension, which you, which you point out, that paradoxical tension is where I want to live and exist. Because I think that's where the vast majority of the world's oppressed right now are living and existing. Well, no, first of all, I, I hope that I'm not making it sound like I'm for radical charity because I'm very much against charity. Charity really just makes me feel good about myself. It doesn't really cost me anything to, you know, write a check, you know, or to give an extra, my, you know, my old clothes that I'm no longer using or, or to just, you know, be paternalistic towards those who have less than me. I, I'm really am trying to call for radical justice. I, I'm really am saying that the system is so, so constructed against the vast majority of the world's population that really what I'm calling for is overturning the tables at the temple and dealing with the consequences that come when you turn over bankers' tables. Yeah, I think, first of all, the church needs to get saved. So we could begin there. <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is that the white Jesus of the colonizer, and, and, and please, we, when I say the white Jesus, understand that I'm talking ontological whiteness. I'm talking about the Jesus that, that justifies slavery, that justifies neoliberalism, that justifies sexism, that, you know, that Jesus needs to be totally rejected. Because as long as we continue to bow to that Jesus, as James Cone would say, we're really bowing to the satanic Jesus. You know. So, but, but then that's the Jesus that has undergirded much of American Christianity. 
you know, it's the Jesus that that allowed the genocide of the indigenous people, that allowed, that, that justified the bringing over a slave on the first ship that was called the Jesus of all things. You know, we need to reject that Jesus. And, and we need to find, you know, the Jesus that is rooted among the very least of these, that what you do to me, you do unto them. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's a conversion experience. You know, not just a, a, a an intellectual conversion, but I would argue a spiritual conversion as, as well. And that's not easy to do when you can make so much money on the dominant white Jesus right now. You know, so it, it's a task, you know, that I do, double dog dare you all to try. Please, please, please. I mean, just, you know, if you have hope, good, great. All power to you. I, I don't want to, you know, sound like the Scrooge that stole, you know, Christmas. But, but, but what I want to argue is, even after you do all these things, you know you're only going to be paid 50 cents on the dollar if you're a Latina to what a man makes, a white man makes. So, so even though you play by all the rules, the structures are still going to be bent against you to fail. And what I'm saying is embrace that and then begin those subversive acts that overturn that. Okay? I mean, definitely, I, I, first in my generation to get, a, to get an education and go to college and get a PhD, first, you know, to ever get a PhD. But while that may have been hopeful to try to do, at the end of the day, I still faced all the racist garbage by occupying the Latino body. And that's where the hopelessness comes in. And I just accept that and embrace that. And then try to over, overturn that. Yeah. Are we done? I mean, I, I can keep going, but up to you. Stop there. Okay. Sure, definitely. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>